Uh, I'm really honored here to be here to, to introduce our next speaker. Um, we have Dr. Francis Finucane with us. And uh, he qualified at an RCSI and has uh, very much trained in uh, endocrinology, diabetes, um, and general internal medicine between doing research here and at Cambridge as well. Uh, so uh, here in Ireland, he's returned to become a leader in developing clinical services for people with obesity and other metabolic disorders, as that's one of his specialties. So I'm very excited to uh, invite him up to the stage to, to, for his speech. Um, titled Too Many Fat People. <laughs> Thanks very much, Tariq, and uh, for the opportunity to share some thoughts with you this afternoon about the, uh, the global obesity epidemic and, and some of the things we might do to address it. So, in Ireland at the moment, 61% of adults. Uh, that's most people are either overweight or obese. And that's a frightening statistic because we know that carrying excess body fat is bad for you. And there's no doubt that obesity arises as a result of an imbalance between, on the one hand, uh, energy intake in the form of dietary calorie uh, ingestion, and on the other hand, uh, the uh, energy expenditure in the form of things like physical activity and exercise. So the behavioral sort of components that give rise to obesity are clear and unequivocal, and there's no, uh, there's no controversy about those. However, when you look a little bit deeper uh, into the causes and the etiology of the obesity epidemic, there's actually quite a deal of controversy among scientists and clinicians about uh, what the causes are and how best to approach those. So on the one hand, you've got the traditional view espoused uh, about 20 years ago that obesity arises as a result of gluttony or sloth or a combination of these two things. And uh, that you know, it represents a moral failure at an individual level if you're carrying too much weight. Now, thankfully, over the last number of years, there's been an increasing appreciation of the underlying me uh, the biological mechanisms that give rise to obesity. So we've come a long way, for example, in our understanding of the uh, genetic etiology associated with obesity. So let me give you an example. In order to determine the heritability of body mass index and fatness, uh, you can do twin studies where you compare the similarities in body weight between identical and non-identical twins. So it's a very robust way of isolating out environment, shared environmental factors. And with those studies, we can estimate the heritability of obesity to be between 40 and 80%. Now that's about the same degree of heritability as height. So how heavy you are as an adult is about as strongly determined by genes uh, and, and, and factors from your parents as how tall you are, which is remarkable and what uh, surprises many, uh, many people in the medical field. So uh, we know now uh, that uh, obesity should be considered more of a, a heritable disorder, uh, a neurobehavioral disorder rather than a, a sort of a, 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 a sort of a moral flaw. And it's a highly sensitive uh, to environmental conditions. And that's kind of best described by O'Reilly and Faruqi uh, a number of years ago. And we've been fortunate enough to have Steve O'Reilly present to us at Grand Rounds at NUIG on, on a couple of occasions in the last few years. So we need to see obesity in this context, I believe, because in order to do it, it when we do that, uh, we can adopt more uh, effective public health strategies to combat the problem. So at the moment, the public health strategy feels like uh, uh, a little bit futile to someone like myself at the moment. I mean, we tend to sort of take the Mary Queen of Scots approach and say, let them eat less, you know? Uh, and that doesn't work very well. Trying to persuade people to eat less and exercise more is a bit like uh, asking someone who's got a, a mental health illness, uh, issue like depression uh, to have a more positive mental attitude and cheer up. Uh, so I, I think we need to take uh, an approach at an environmental level in order to, uh, to, in order to kind of shift the population distribution of fatness over to the left again. So we know that variations within the population arise as a result of genetic differences. But changes in the population have arisen because the environment has changed. The solution then is to change the envir environment back again. So how, why, how might we do that? Okay, there are a number of things we could, we could do in order to make the environment less obesogenic. And I couldn't go into them all today. I mean, it's a complex relationship between the environment and body fatness. But let's pick one thing. 
What about a junk food tax? Or more technically, a health-related food tax? Would that be a good idea or a bad idea? Well, the first thing is it would be unpopular. Okay, so to the man on the street, it would be an additional financial burden uh, in, in, in a time of unprecedented economic challenges. Okay, so nobody's going to like it. But I would ask you, what tax is popular? Nobody likes tax, of course. And yet governments use taxation all the time to influence our behavior. For example, they encourage us to drive greener cars by influencing the price of those cars and the, the, the cost of taxing it on a yearly basis uh, on the basis of emissions. So if your car is fuel efficient and doesn't produce a lot of smoke, then it's going to be less expensive for you to run. And that's the primary reason why most people choose to drive those cars. Okay, so it's the same across a broad range of activities in society. And you know, Ireland is a plucky little country when it comes to making progressive policy uh, uh, um, decisions uh, in order to improve the environment and, and, and population health. So for example, in 2004, uh, we were the first nation in the world to introduce uh, a universal working place, uh, workplace smoking ban. And that worked very effectively. The Irish population are well able to take these changes on, even in the face of apparent sort of resistance to them. In actual fact, they're pretty sophisticated people, and we'd be able to, where something makes sense, I think we, 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 can, we can adapt to them pretty quickly, those policies. All right, so that was 2004. Step back a couple of years to 2002, when the government were concerned about how much plastic bags we were using. Okay, so what did they do? They said, let's influence the consumption of those plastic bags by introducing a, a plastic bag tax of 15 cent at the time. And they raised that subsequently to 22 cent to disincentivize it further. What happened to plastic bag consumption? Well, it went from 328 plastic bags per person per year in 2002. Overnight, it dropped to 21 plastic bags per person per year. That's a 93.6% reduction in plastic bag consumption overnight. Secondarily, but crucially importantly, the money generated from this initiative was 182 million euro over the first 10 years, okay? So this was an excellent way of generating funds that could be then transferred back into the Department of the Environment to enhance our collection of litter and, and those kinds of things. Okay, and it had a very significant effect on population behavior. Okay, so there's no doubt that it's a fundamental principle of economics, as evidenced by its mention in the book that invented economics, The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith that if you want to encourage people to do less of something, you make it more expensive. Everybody knows that, okay. And so a health-related food tax would be like any other so-called Peguvian tax, okay? Like the tax that we impose on uh, people who produce lots of air pollution, okay? So Peguvian taxes technically are designed to reduce the so-called negative externalities uh, or the costs associated with, uh, with, with an activity. So in our case, the negative externalities would be the health consequences and the co health costs of eating, uh, of, of eating too much unhealthy food. So those negative externalities mitigate the social costs of something that's deemed to be uh, undesirable. Okay, and it's a generic, uh, uh, it's a generic technique to, to, to achieve those aims. So here's the thing about Peguvian taxation. The first thing to say is that it's arbitrarily defined. We don't know how much of a tax to impose on, health, uh, on junk foods in order to reduce their consumption or to improve population health. We'd have, to pick, uh, we'd have to carefully consider it, but it would still be arbitrarily defined. Does that mean that we shouldn't do it? Well, I don't believe it, it, it does mean that. The second thing about Peguvian taxation is that often the evidence base that it has an impact on, say, population health is very poor. It doesn't exist often. And that's certainly true. There is no evidence that if we tax junk food or we introduce a health-related food tax, that it will impact on obesity levels or that it will impact on population behaviors over time. Is that a limitation of, uh, 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 of the intervention or is it, is it a limitation of something else? Let me tell you, it's an intervention of the science and the techniques that we use to measure human behavior like physical activity or dietary intake. And it's a, it, it's a limitation of, of our ability to track body mass index and diabetes rates over time in the population. And the fact is that 
something like a health-related food tax would be likely to have a very small effect at an individual level, but it overall uh, it would affect such a large number of people that the population attributable risk, the disease burden associated with excess um, unhealthy food consumption, would actually drop significantly. And that's a fundamental principle of population health. And I think governments, and our government included, need to invoke the so-called precautionary principle in this case. That is, where there is a lack of evidence that taking an initiative is going to provide good, if there's overwhelming probability that it's likely to do that, then there's an onus on governments to instigate policies on that basis. Okay? So it's called a precautionary principle, and we use it in lots of other things, like air pollution. Now, people say that health-related food taxes would be regressive. And by that, I mean that they would uh, have a disproportionate influence on poor people as opposed to the better off in society. Again, that is absolutely true. Unequivocally, uh, it would have a greater impact on the budget uh, and the disposable income of poorer people for various reasons, not least because uh, there's a socioeconomic gradient between you know, the health, uh, the, 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 the quality of the diet that people take uh, in poor people compared to rich people. Does that mean we shouldn't do it? Well, again, I don't believe so. Uh, if you consider that poor people are going to have a greater economic disincentive not to eat the uh, unhealthy foods, then we're going to be in a situation where there's actually a greater, the, 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 the health benefits of the tax would actually be progressive in that uh, poor people may, may, may have a disproportionate benefit from it. And in fact, uh, such a tax may well negate or reduce uh, disparities in, in health outcomes uh, across the socioeconomic um, divide. The other thing to say about uh, the, the tax, if it generates income, we could divert some of the income generated uh, into, uh, into policies or, or into strategies to encourage people to eat healthier food. We could subsidize healthy food for, for, for poorer people, for example, if we means tested that. But economists will tell you that hypothecation is bad. And hypothecation is that process of saying, OK, we're going to tax this uh, and we're going to generate a certain amount of income from taxing uh, this activity and then we're going to ring fence that income that we ta get from this tax and we're going to invest it somewhere else. So we're going to uh, rob Peter to pay Paul. Economists will tell you that that's bad economics. Now that may be true but it doesn't stop us hypothecating in other aspects of taxation. And while I'm not an expert economist, I would say that when you look at road taxes um, being diverted into, in, 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 car taxes, road fund licenses being divi diverted into, uh, into taxing cars, and when you look at uh, the Department of the Environment website and how they've counted every penny from that uh, plastic bag tax and they've reinvested that in, 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 in environmental initiatives, I think it would be relatively straightforward uh, to quantify the tax that we generate from, from a health-related food tax and plough some of that money, say, to the Troika, some of that money back into primary prevention strategies and helping people to eat healthier. And then we could also possibly use some of the money uh, to uh, invest in hospital services for people with severe obesity. Okay. So to summarise then in relation to, to a health-related food tax, it would be a blunt instrument it would be regressive in that it would have a disproportionate effect on poor people. It would be arbitrarily defined even if it was carefully considered. But I believe it would be a step in the right direction. It would be a good start. It would undoubtedly have an effect on uh, population health, probably. But it would also mitigate the societal costs associated with excess food consumption, which, are, which, which nobody doubts. Um, and I think it would take a brave Minister for Health and a brave government cabinet to instigate such a policy. And I think we need to change the way we look at the obesity epidemic. We need to change our approach. Rather than seeing too many fat people, we need to see an environment where there's too much access to unhealthy, high density, uh, poor quality calories. And there's also reduced opportunities for physical activity, which is another day's talk. Rather than seeing the obesity epidemic as a burden on society caused by irresponsible individuals, we need to see obesity as a burden on those affected individuals who are biologically predisposed to excess body weight within an irresponsible and greedy society where corporate profits come ahead of population health. And 
my day-to-day -day job involves the care for people with very severe obesity. And in my interactions with them, and through my understanding of the neurobiology and the, the behavioral aspects of, of severe obesity problems, I can tell you this. It's not their fault. It's not their fault. It's not their fault. It's our fault. Thank you.